many of the interviews that we're doing were people who were on the ground and who were there at Sandy Hook for the day, for the days and for the weeks. But for you, you were in the newsroom. Talk to me about what that newsroom felt like the day of, the morning of, when things started to be clear about what was happening. Well, the first thing that I remember happening was that we were in a meeting about um, Yukon and the Big East. Something was going on around that. And um, the news director, Colleen Marin at the time, came into the office and said, there's been a shooting at, at a school in Newtown, and we're sending everyone. And then as things progressed, we knew that you know people were making their way there. We didn't have crews down there. So we were kind of just sort of going by what we could get on, fo on the phone and everything. But the mood in the newsroom gradually was, you know, getting more and more tense. And the feeling was disbelief, obviously, fear. Um, there was also, and I don't know when it uh, came apparent, but one of the Hartford Current reporters, um, his stepdaughter was one of the teachers, the staff who was, you know, who was killed. And I don't know where that sort of came in. But it was a, a feeling of trying to gather information, trying to process that information, uh, both from a TV standpoint and a newspaper standpoint and an online standpoint and keeping that all updated. And it was just sort of coming in, but, but it was a lot of stuff that like later turned out not to be true, but we'd hear these things, you know, that there was something going on in the woods near the school and things like that, that just, you know, we had to kind of reach an understanding about how that was, you know, how that fit into a larger process. And in the days that followed, I remember I wrote to a friend, um, it's hard to express. People here, here are burning out of manic energy. If I buy into that, I'll go crazy. If I mull it over, I'll just be crushingly sad. I started seeing dates on the kids. I'll start over. Start it. It's hard to express. People here are burning with a manic energy. If I buy into that, I'll go crazy. If I mull it over, I'll just be crushingly sad. I started seeing dates the kids were born on, and I welled up. It's a tightrope, not too much of this, not too much of that. There will be a point where I'll cry a lot, but not right now. And I just remember, like, we've got a job to do. We need to move forward with that. And different things like the shooter's name, um, where he was from, you know, and then just the disbelief that, this had happened, and I, I texted another friend, uh, the same friend, I texted the same friend at, at some point and said, um, CBS is reporting 27 dead, and he wrote back, is that a typo? And I wrote, no. And I think, and I've seen this happen in other cases like this where you go along for a long time and you don't know the full extent of it, and then all of a sudden you do. And there's just like, well, that's got to be wrong. That's got to be a mistake. And it's just this disbelief. When did those emotions finally hit you? It seems like the day of was still that disbelief, still that, that feeling of this is not happening, this is inconceivable, this is just a dream. Yeah. When did that finally... I think by the afternoon, by the late afternoon, um, then it became clear that um, this had happened.
Um, I think by the time I think by the time the late afternoon rolled around, and we knew the extent of it, and they had made I believe they had made official announcements by that point. Um, things were becoming clearer, and it was just this, um, like a, a blanket over the newsroom, and it, it was it was very quiet. Um, and if you've been in a newsroom, you know they're noisy places. Um, there was just sort of this, you know, we've got a job to do, and we're gonna we're gonna keep doing it. How did that happen? How did you guys keep doing your job in the newsroom? What what did it take from you and from your colleagues to keep doing our job? It took realizing that we had a job to do, that we had to tell a story, that this was obviously such an important event. We had to we had to tell a story. We had to give depth to the story to make it clear all the things that had happened and how that would later impact things as time went by. Sorry. Um, I, th I think it's a, it, you have this sense of professionalism. You have to, you do your job, you go and you have to tell that story. You have to do it responsibly. You have to do it fairly. And that's kind of your overall mission. And you kind of put the, that, the other things to the side. Um, but the reality is about that is that that has a long-term impact. You're experiencing that trauma secondhand um, or thirdhand almost, and it still impacts you. And you don't know how that rolls out over the course of time. Um, how you cope with it and how you deal with it. Um, about three years before uh, Sandy Hook had happened, we lost a, a beloved member of the news team. And part of it was just getting through and it was that same feeling we're gonna we're gonna move on we have a show to do we have a stories to write we have things to do and for me I know my coping mechanism is what I what I said you know I, I, I'm very balanced I try and balance very much how how much I what I need to know, I'll learn what I need to know, but I don't go a lot farther until I know I'm ready to go a lot farther. Um, but still, you are you have moments of, like, you know, they were only six years old. You know, and just, and for me, I didn't have kids, I don't have kids, but I know that the parents in the newsroom just, had a much more difficult time because they could see themselves, you know, they could see their kids in those situations. So now we've reached 10 years since the tragedy. Stories are still being told, memories are still being remembered and honored, and legacies and lives are still touching a lot of people. What do you hold still true to yourself? when it comes to telling the story of the people of Sandy Hook, the people of Newtown, and just that day that changed Connecticut? I think it's easy to recite the facts. I think it's easy to say, well, this happened, and then this happened, and then this happened. But to stop and think about the impact of the loss for all those friends and family. And I think it, it's, it's a lot harder to do. And I look at how the families have dealt with and responded to the tragedy um, and tried to build something better, make a positive change. 
um, I think that that's a, that gives me hope. Um, I think I think that from a rule of law perspective, it's a lot harder to think of that, to see how the availability of guns um, makes that kind of crime, you know, more prevalent. Um, and I think the other piece that really saddens me is how it used to feel like these things happened, you know, in this column mine at Virginia Tech and, you know, and now they just seem to come right out one right after another. We're barely finished with one before we start, we get a, we get the next one. Um, and I think also, I don't know whether you use, use this or not. For, for me as a, as a gay man, seeing um, these things happen in the Pulse and the club in Colorado Springs, that just really impacts how I function in my day-to-day -day life, you know, being aware of being in crowds and things like that. And, and I know that I'm more vigilant about what I see people doing and, you know, safety strategies and, and things like that. How to exit a building, what to, what to do, how to, how to manage, you know, if you're in this space, what are you going to, where, where, where do you go if something happens?